everyone, my name is Natalie. I am the Oncology Pharmacy Resident here at Monument Health Cancer Care Institute. And my clinical pearl for this month is looking at mannitol use with cisplatin. And I came upon this topic by, by first uh, learning that we used to offer routine mannitol with our cisplatin infusions, but then quit doing that uh, based on a drug shortage and a variety of other factors. And then I was listening to a podcast and they were saying that it may actually be coming back into, into clinical practice. So then I wanted to do a little more research about this topic. So I first wanna talk about the incidence and pathophysiology of nephrotoxicity with cisplatin talk about our current strategies for managing and preventing nephrotoxicity with cisplatin, and then finally talk about, talk about literature findings related to mannitol and its effectiveness for, for decreasing the incidence of cisplatin-induced nephrotoxicity. First off, I wanted to just go into some background about cisplatin and the risk for nephrotoxicity. So cisplatin is our predominant platinum, platinum-based alkylating agent used widely in a variety of malignancies, including head and neck, lung, and cervical. And you can see in the diagram on the right there, cisplatin is a reactive compound, undergoes activation and equation, and then that, that platinum will form intrastrand adducts as well as interstrand crosslinks. It does come with a variety of, of adverse events, unfortunately, so notorious for causing nausea and vomiting, can also cause neurotoxicity as well as bone marrow suppression and ototoxicity. And then as we mentioned, um, also a big concern for nephrotoxicity. So looking more in depth at the risk for cisplatin and nephrotoxicity, so acute kidney injury has been found to develop in 15 to 35% of patients treated with cisplatin, and this does append appear to be a dose-dependent effect. Unfortunately, this statistic, though, is occurring despite our standard uh, management strategies that we, that we have for preventing nephrotoxicity. So nephrotoxicity is considered the major dose-limiting toxicity with cisplatin. For that reason, we generally avoid use in patients that have a creatinine clearance less than 60. And as I mentioned, it does appear to be dose related, but particularly with cisplatin doses greater than 100 milligrams per meter squared, there can be risk for irreversible nephrotoxicity. Our, our kidney damage is typically going to occur within the first 10 days of treatment, but these effects can persist for up to three weeks. In terms of our pathophysiology of nephrotoxicity, so it really has to do with the accumulation of cisplatin in the proximal tubule cells. And cisplatin gets um, taken up by the organic cation transporters. And then in the tubular epithelial cells, that cisplatin concentration is estimated to be about five times more than in the, in the bloodstream and then can lead to direct tubular epithelial damage. Cisplatin has also been shown to cause vasoconstriction of the microvasculature and, and decreased perfusion, and then also has pro-inflammatory effects. It can cause direct damage to the mitochondria of cells, as well as cause generation of reactive oxygen species. So what do we do to prevent and manage nephrotoxicity? So first off, really aggressive IV hydration is gonna be our standard practice before and after cisplatin infusions to help decrease the half-life of the drug as well as the concentration in the urine. And then as we talked about those, those tubular cells being very um, at risk for, for uh, damage, gonna to help to decrease that transit time in those cells. However, the use of diuretics, as we're going to talk more about, has been somewhat controversial, and this has included loop diuretics like furosemide as well as mannitol. And really, the diuretics, the thought behind them is, is pretty similar to use of, of IB hydration. So we really want to help to decrease that, that drug concentration of cisplatin in the urine by increasing the water excretion and then help to prevent reabsorption of, of our electrolytes. Also, diuretics have been shown to decrease the rate of that activation of cisplatin that we saw um, by equation. So talking a little more about mannitol specifically, Mannitol is one of our osmotic diuretics, so it works by increasing the osmotic pressure of the filtrate. And so that, by increasing that osmotic pressure, is going to pull water and electrolytes and really prevent the tubular reabsorption of, of water and electrolytes, as well as, of course, being a diuretic is going to increase urine output. 
there, it is available in two different preparations. We have a 20% and a 25%. Unfortunately, we, we don't have great uh, dosing information. So the NCCN guidelines recommend mannitol use per institutional standards. As we'll see in the literature, though, the majority of clinical trials have used between 12.5 and 25 grams of IV mannitol um, around the cisplatin infusion. So again, with, with mannitol and cisplatin, the thought is that we're going to help to decrease that concentration of cisplatin in the kidneys and, and in the urine. However, with it being a diuretic, there is definitely a risk for overdiuresis and then, of course, leading to dehydration and, and worsening of, of acute kidney injury. So that's where this protective role with diuretics is debatable. And then as we'll talk about in the literature, we've seen variable efficacy for its ability to decrease nephrotoxicity. Some studies have shown really no benefit in comparison to hydration alone. Other studies have shown that there can be benefit, especially with patients receiving higher doses of cisplatin, so over 100 milligrams per meter squared. But then to complicate things further, there was a nationwide mannitol drug shortage in 2012, and so a lot of facilities had to remove mannitol from their hydration protocols just because it was no longer available. But then in the you know time since then, we've had some ability to kind of look back and, and see if, if that was even efficacious. And so as a result, um, you know, many, many centers have, have, re have removed mannitol, um, as, as have we, uh, from their standard hydration regimens. So next, I wanted to just dive into the literature, specifically looking at mannitol use for, for reducing the risk for nephrotoxicity with cisplatin. So the first study that I looked at went very, way, way back in the literature. This was a study uh, published in Cancer in 1977. This was actually really, I think, a dose-finding study for cisplatin. But this was a prospective observational trial looking at cisplatin, 120 milligrams per meter squared. And patients received two liters of D5 half NS um, the evening before treatment. And then the day of treatment, they received 12.5 grams of mannitol immediately before cisplatin. And then they received a continuous infusion for six hours after, after cisplatin of both mannitol and half NS. For inclusion, they included patients that had a creatinine clearance above 50 and a performance status greater than 20%. They excluded patients that had any history of serious cardiac or pulmonary comorbidities. So this study included 60 patients, although only 52 of them had reportable uh, renal function. And they did find in this study that mannitol diuresis did help prevent nephrotoxicity. So looking at the elevations in serum creatinine following cisplatin, you can see in that um, table two that there certainly is a dose dependent trend where serum creatinine would raise from two to three and then um, three or, or higher. They did show that 10 patients developed a serum creatinine greater than two and one patient um, did, did pass away due to both renal and bone marrow failure. However, in this study, they, they showed that mannitol did help decrease that, that platinum binding to those sensitive renal tubular cells and help prevent the development of severe nephrotoxicity, particularly thinking about the prolonged half-life of that, of that platinum agent in cisplatin. Um, so in this study, they found half-life of 51 to 72 hours. A second study that I looked at was published in 1982. This was a prospective phase two trial looking at the efficacy of cisplatin with IV hydration alone or IV hydration with mannitol, which is kind of the, the standard for a lot of the studies that we'll be looking at. But this was looking at cisplatin 100 milligrams per meter squared every three weeks. And for those that received mannitol, they received 12.5 grams IV just before the cisplatin as well as 25 grams as a IV infusion in D5W over six hours after the infusion. These were patients that had previously treated advanced melanoma. So for inclusion, they had to have melanoma with measurable metastatic lesions, as well as an expected survival greater than or equal to 10 weeks, and then relatively adequate renal function with a creatinine clearance greater than or equal to 60, and they had to have melanoma that was refractory to, to their prior chemotherapy. 
So this study, they enrolled 67 patients, 33 of them did not receive mannitol, 34 did receive mannitol. And you can see for um, this trial, they did show that those that received mannitol experienced a lower rate of the more severe nephrotoxicity. So looking at um, that table that we have here in the renal toxicities, um, so looking at that moderate, severe, life-threatening, or fatal uh, outcomes with, with renal function, you can see it's certainly a higher percentage in the group that did not receive mannitol. So 21% um, versus 4% with mannitol. In terms of all grades of toxicity with, nef with uh, nephrotoxicity, this was also lower with mannitol. So 33% versus 39%. And then they also found that patients that received mannitol were able to have more cumulative doses of cisplatin administered. Another study, a little, little more recent, was published in um, 2010. This was a retrospective chart review, again, looking at rates of nephrotoxicity with IV hydration and forced diuresis versus IV hydration alone. So these patients received uh, normal saline, and they could have received potassium supplementation as well with that, with that IV hydration. Optionally, they could receive NS after cisplatin. And then for their diuretic, they used the 12.5 grams of mannitol with the IV hydration. Hydration. They included patients receiving cisplatin doses of greater than or equal to 40 milligrams per meter squared, as well as a baseline creatinine clearance of greater than or equal to 60. So this study, they evaluated 92 patient records. Mean cisplatin dose was 64.5 milligrams per meter squared. And this study actually looked at the, the decrease in creatinine clearance between the groups, a little different outcome than we looked at previously. So they showed that among the patients that received the sodium load, so the IV hydration alone, that decrease was 33.9 mils per minute in comparison to 38.9 mils with the sodium load with mannitol, which was not a significant p-value. They also did not note any um, grade 3 or 4 nephrotoxicity uh, in either group. So in general, they found uh, similar rates of nephrotoxicity as well as hospitalization and electrolyte imbalances between the groups. It was interesting to note that they did see a significant difference in time to resolution of the nephrotoxicity, however, which um, was not found to be statistically significant, but, you know, I, I would argue maybe clinically significant. So they found a um, time to resolution of 129.3 days with the patients that received just IV hydration in comparison to 23 days with IV hydration and mannitol. And the authors definitely commented on this finding, and they talked about how it may have been due to a difference in the hydration protocol. So the patients that received mannitol received a liter of fluids before and after, and those that only received IV hydration received a, just a liter of fluids. So they thought that could have contributed. Also, as a retrospective study, this was looking just at the time that the labs were resulted for, for monitoring of renal function, so may not have you know, truly been the time that they actually had resolution of their, of their nephrotoxicity, but was the best parameter that we could monitor. So in conclusion, they didn't find a significant difference in incidence of nephrotoxicity between the groups looking at IV hydration alone or, or with mannitol. And then I looked at a, at a study published in 2014. This was a single center retrospective quasi-experimental study, again, due to our nationwide um, drug shortage of mannitol starting in 2012. This looked at the development of AKI of any grade using the common toxicity criteria. And this looked at patients uh, receiving monotherapy with cisplatin, and then they divided them into four groups. So they first divided them by dose of cisplatin, so cisplatin 30 milligrams per meter squared or 100 milligrams per meter squared. And then within those groups, they looked at those that received mannitol and those that did not, so four, four total dosing groups. Again, for inclusion, um, just had to be receiving single agent cisplatin. In this study, they evaluated 143 patients, majority of them, 97.2% had head and neck cancer. 58 of them did not receive mannitol and 85 did receive mannitol. In this study, they did find that those that did not receive mannitol had a higher rate of nephrotoxicity, so odds ratio of 2.646 with a significant p-value. And then they did a multivariate analysis of, of those that received the 100 milligrams per meter squared, as well as those that had a history of hypertension, and, and found that those um, definitely as well had a higher risk for nephrotoxicity. So odds ratio of 11.494 for high-dose cisplatin 
and then for pre-existing hypertension, odds ratio of 3.219 with significant p-values. Um, the authors did not note if there was any specific, you know, blood pressure readings that they considered hypertension. Um, so I think it was just if it was a history of hypertension at all, not so much based on blood pressure readings. So in terms of the drug shortage, these authors concluded that for patients receiving high dose cisplatin as well as those with pre-existing hypertension, you know, they should definitely be, be prioritized to receive mannitol during the limited supply. I think it's interesting to note with this story, though, looking or this this uh, trial, excuse me, looking at their incidence of, of rates of acute kidney injury of any grade. Um, so we have the, the columns represent the the dosing of cisplatin, so 30 milligrams per meter squared or 100 milligrams per meter squared, and then looking at that percentage of patients who develop any grade of AKI. So we certainly do see a dose-dependent risk. Um, so looking at those two columns on the right being our, our higher doses of, of cisplatin, but there was no significant difference between groups. So p-value greater than 0.05 for a difference between groups. But again, with the multivariate analysis is where they, they found that difference in terms of pre-existing hypertension tension as well as cisplatin greater than 100 milligrams per meter squared. And then the last study that I looked at was published in 2016. This was a single center retrospective chart review, again, based on our, our mannitol drug shortage. And at this center, you know, they had removed it from their hydration protocol. So this study looked at rates of grade three or higher um, increases in serum creatinine with saline hydration versus saline hydration and mannitol. So these patients had to initiate treatment with cisplatin, 100 milligrams per meter squared with concurrent radiation. And then all patients received a liter of NS, both pre and post hydration. And then the mannitol group received the 12.5 grams of mannitol. They included patients with the baseline creatinine greater than or equal to 70 mils per minute. And then again, had to have a starting cisplatin dose of 100 milligrams per meter squared. This study included 139 patients, um, and they did find that the mannitol group had a lower rate of the, of the primary outcome of the grade three or higher increases in serum creatinine compared to the, the group that received IV hydration alone. So odds ratio of 0 0.16 with a significant p-value. And you can see in the table, looking at both the univariate and multivariable analysis, that that odds ratio was the same, uh, so odds ratio of 0 0.16. They also did not see any grade four events in either group. So they, they noted that the addition of mannitol to their prehydration fluid did help decrease the incidence of, of um, grade three or higher increases in serum creatinine. However, they also noted a significant increased risk for hyponatremia with mannitol, but, but this was, man, was manageable. So at this facility, based on the results of their findings, they actually added mannitol back to their standard hydration protocol. And then the last study, a little, little different than the ones that we have been looking at, was published in 2003. This was a prospective single center observational study. And I just included this because I think it's interesting to just look at the differences in terms of diuretic use in, in this study. So this was looking at incidence of cisplatin-induced nephrotoxicity, looking at three different hydration protocols, and, and these patients received cisplatin 75 milligrams per meter squared every three weeks. So all patients received two liters of saline. And then in terms of the diuretics, patients received either 50 grams of mannitol with cisplatin or furosemide 40 milligrams after hydration. These were in adult female patients receiving cisplatin either alone or in combination with 5-FU or paclitaxel for treatment of a gynecologic malignancy. They excluded patients that received nephrotoxic medications like aminoglycosides or those that could falsely elevate the serum creatinine, as well as patients with a diabetes or renal impairment or poor performance status, prior abdominal radiation, or any health condition that could be worsened by, by fluid hydration such as heart failure. So this study, they included 49 patients. Again, all of them were female. And as we saw in the previous study, they looked at that change in creatinine clearance from pre to post infusion. So you can see, uh, looking at our three different groups here, saline only, saline and furosemide, and saline and mannitol, that there was a, a worsening of creatinine clearance with the saline and mannitol group. Again, 17 patients in this 
in this study were in that arm, but was a significant difference between groups, and you can see that in the, in the highlighted in yellow in the graph as well. So again, higher incidence of nephrotoxicity here was saline and mannitol compared to saline alone or saline with furosemide. So I wanted to move on to a summary just of all the trials that we've looked at and then finish by talking about two systematic reviews that will hopefully put, put everything into perspective. <laughs> So looking at our, our trials that we looked at, again, we looked at that initial dose finding study for cisplatin in 1977 that did show that mannitol diuresis helped prevent nephrotoxicity. 1982, we have our phase two trial that also showed a lower rate of, of nephrotoxicity with mannitol. 2010, we have a retrospective chart review that did not show a significant difference um, in terms of preventing nephrotoxicity with mannitol. And then in 2014, we have our, our largest study of 143 patients. This was a retrospective quasi-experimental study, also included uh, different doses of cisplatin. And they showed that patients that did not receive mannitol did have higher rates of nephrotoxicity, but especially among patients that had hypertension and those receiving cisplatin 100 milligrams per meter squared. Another one of our larger studies in 2016 with 139 patients, also a retrospective chart review, looked at um, cisplatin 100 milligrams per meter squared with radiation and also showed that, that mannitol helped to decrease the incidence of grade three or higher increases in serum creatinine, but also was noted to significantly increase the risk for hyponatremia. And then we have a study published in 2003 of 49 patients looking at use of uh, furosemide versus mannitol. And this study did actually find a higher incidence of nephrotoxicity with saline and mannitol compared to either saline alone or saline and furosemide. I think it's important to note in this study, though, the mannitol dose was 50 grams um, IV, and in comparison to the other studies we looked at, ranging from 12.5 to, to 25 grams IV. So as I mentioned, I want to just finish with a couple systematic reviews. This first systematic review published in 2012, I think just brought up some really important points about use of mannitol. So first off, they talked about our variable dosing for both IV fluids as well as mannitol. We, we just don't really have any guideline standards for either of these treatments. But certainly important to think about, you know, unless we have adequate hydration for the patient, forced diuresis can certainly increase that risk for dehydration as well as risk for um, AKI. So important to think about as well, especially thinking about that, that study that used 50 grams of IV mannitol. And then they also mentioned, um, which is something I hadn't thought about, you know, thinking about our, our better antiemetic regimens we have with cisplatin, and then thinking about those earlier studies where we did not have that. So potentially there could have been a higher risk for dehydration and acute kidney injury just from the worst nausea and vomiting that could have occurred. And then we do have certainly variable cisplatin doses ranging from 40 to 120 milligrams per meter squared. And we do certainly see in all of the studies that there is a dose dependent trend with, with nephrotoxicity and cisplatin. So this systematic review concluded that there's no strong evidence at this time to support routine use of, of diuresis over just our standard IV fluids alone for preventing nephrotoxicity. The last systematic review I looked at was a little more recent, published in 2017. And this looked at 24 studies with the majority of them, 75% using forced diuresis. We see our most common malignancies being lung, head and neck, and gynecologic. And I think they just kind of help summarize the, the most effective uh, methods that we have to date for preventing nephrotoxicity. So they recommend outpatient hydration over two to six hours with two to four liters of NS. They also recommend magnesium supplementation, which is not something that we have really talked about in this presentation, but has been shown to help decrease that risk for renal tubular damage as well. And then they recommend consideration for use of mannitol with high dose cisplatin, so greater than or equal to 100 milligrams per meter squared, as well as for those patients with pre-existing hypertension. And this is just a summary, again, of, of their main, main points for both um, outpatient IV hydration and then highlighted in yellow are the instances where we would potentially consider the addition of mannitol. So in summary, unfortunately, nephrotoxicity, despite our, 
um, you know, current prevention and management strategies is still the dose limiting side effect with cisplatin and AKI can occur in up to 15 to 35% of patients and certainly is a dose dependent effect. So we have seen irreversible nephrotoxicity with cisplatin doses greater than 100 milligrams per meter squared. In terms of the pathophysiology, cisplatin is thought to accumulate in the renal tubular epithelial cells. So concentration of cisplatin is about five times higher here than it is in the bloodstream and can lead to direct damage. Cisplatin has also been shown to cause vasoconstriction of the microvasculature of the kidneys and decreased perfusion. And then there's also pro-inflammatory effects, um, especially generation of reactive oxygen species. So in terms of our prevention of nephrotoxicity, really our standard IV fluid hydration, um, again, even though the dosing is variable, is really the most important co component for, for preventing both pre, and it should be given both pre and post cisplatin infusion. And then as we've talked about, the use of diuretics is controversial, especially due to that risk for, for causing dehydration for the patient and then worsening that risk for, for AKI. So in particular, looking at our diuresis with mannitol, the thought being that we're going to help to inhibit that reabsorption of water and electrolytes and then decrease that cisplatin concentration in the urine. At this time, we don't have strong evidence that it should be used over our routine hydration to prevent nephrotoxicity, but there is consideration for, for use of mannitol. Patients receiving cisplatin doses of greater than or equal to 100 milligrams per meter squared, as well as those patients with pre existing hypertension. And those are my references. And thank you all so much for listening to my clinical pearl.